Today we continue our series titled Serve, as we're uh, taking four weeks to examine uh, how God wants us engaged in his body and addressing some of the common uh, mindsets, some of the common misconceptions and issues that keep us uh, from properly functioning within his church. And, and two of them that we've looked at so far, our first week we addressed this idea of consumerism that often creeps into the church. It, it church is about me and how can it serve me and my needs uh, and as, as opposed to how can I be used up or consumed within the church. And Jesus needs to confront that consumerism in us, in all of us, that we bring from the world and turn us into people who are willing to be consumed for the sake of his church, just as he modeled for us. Last week, Pastor Brent talked about our comfort zones, something that all of us struggle uh, to get out of a little bit. Uh, and, and ministry involves getting out of our comfort zones. For all of us, at some point, it was a brand new experience. We were new. It's something that's very different for us, and it's going to put us in situations that are going to require you to get out of your comfort zone. Even the Apostle Peter we saw was stretched well beyond his comfort zone in ministry. It's just part of the package, and it's okay. We're all in it together. Today, we're going to look at one more experience in ministry, one more hindrance that can creep up and keep us from serving the way God wants us to serve. And that's when we address the issue of what happens when I blow it in ministry. I titled that very specifically to what happens when I blow it or when I'm unfaithful. I didn't say what happens if I blow it. Do you see the difference between the two? The question is not a matter of will I blow it or won't I blow it. The question is a matter of what happens when I do because you will if you've been engaged at any time in ministry. That's what we're gonna look at today. In fact, I was just reflecting on this personally and I remember one of my blunders, just a humorous one, uh, on a series I was doing on idols, and I was talking about how we can often pray uh, for personal success, right? We're just praying just that God will bless us, it's all about me. And in my intention to say we pray for my personal success, I said we pray for my personal sex. Yeah, you heard that right. That's what, it just came out, I was going, whoa, I mean, I think I turned like eight shades of of red in the middle of that message going, I can't believe I just said that. In fact, I was at a point of thinking I, it would have been easier to deny Christ three times in that little circle than to say something like that in front of you know, several hundred people. We blow it. We make silly mistakes. We're not perfect like Jesus was perfect. So what happens when we do? And today we're going to look at a story about Peter again and what happened in his life when he blew it. And in doing so, we want to look at two things, two things in two different areas. One is dealing with mindsets, two mindsets that you have to understand if you're going to be healthy in ministry, and then two actions that you must engage in if you're going to be sustained in ministry. Two mindsets that will cripple you from engaging in ministry in a healthy way if you don't embrace them, and two actions that you must take to be sustained for the long haul in ministry. So if you have your Bibles with you, open them up to the Gospel of Luke, is where we'll look at the first passage. We're going to look at two different stories that connect to each other but are separated by a period of time. They're separated by Jesus' death and his resurrection, uh, a key event, but these, ev these stories go together. They're responding one to another. Luke chapter 22, we're going to start in verse 54. If you have one of the Pew Bibles, it'll be on page 883 that we'll start. I'd encourage you to grab one and follow along. We'll also put the passage up on the screen, and you can look there as well. Okay, two mindsets we're going to see and two actions, two mindsets that will cripple us, two actions that will sustain us. This passage says this, and this is right as Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. They've arrested him right here in this scene, and he's being questioned, and, and Peter's there along with him, uh, and this is what happens. It says, then they seized him, that's Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. 
and Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, this referring to the people who were part of the high priest's entourage, you could say they're out there, and Peter's among them at this point. It says, Peter sat down among them. And then it says, a servant girl, a servant of the high priest, seeing him, seeing Peter, as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he, Peter, went out and wept bitterly. Here's my first point. I should expect to blow it at times in ministry. I should expect to blow it at times in ministry. Not plan to blow it, not try to blow it, don't misunderstand what I'm saying, but expect that it's gonna be part of your journey. You're gonna blow it. It just happens. It might be a personal moral failure. It might be a failure of commitment and not showing up when you committed to it. That's a lot like Peter's in some ways. Peter was stating his loyalty earlier. Oh, Jesus, I'll follow you to death. I'll, I'll, I'll be committed to you. And then when it came time to show up, so to speak, he didn't show up. He blew it. Some of us do the same thing. We state our loyalty. Yeah, I'll serve. I'll be part of this. And it's great when we're putting our little name on a piece of paper or we're saying in that point, yeah, I'll be part of it. But then when, when the rubber meets the road and other commitments are pushing in or other opportunities and you say, I'm not going to be there. We blow it as well. I know personally, I've blown it on a number of different levels. I can think of things, not just silly, humorous things like this, but things I've said from the pulpit, they were actually were uh, somewhat offensive. Not that they offended someone, because that often happens, but something that how I phrased it was not the most godly way to phrase it. And people have called me on that. And I've at times apologized from the pulpit the next Sunday saying, you know what, I could have said this in a better way. I've blown it. Anytime you speak in front of people, you're going to say things uh, that come out that just aren't the best phrasing. I've had to do the same with individuals, people that I've hurt or handled a, a situation improperly or poorly. I've had to go back and apologize in situations where I blew it in how I handled a situation. I've even had things where personally I realized I needed to tell the elders and say, hey man, I just blew it in this situation personally and I need to confess it and seek forgiveness. It's part of being in ministry. It comes with the package. In fact, I can look out over this congregation and see many of you whom I know personally have blown it in life but you've stayed engaged. You've been restored, and you're serving today. In fact, I want to ask you to do something uh, very courageous today, and I'm the first one standing. If you have ever blown it in ministry, personally or whatever, and you're still serving here in our church, I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm standing with you because I'm one of them. Stand up if you've blown it. You know you've blown it, and you're still engaged. You're still serving. The last service, we had almost the whole place standing up. So you guys have some issues in here we're going to have to talk about. This message is perfect. Thanks for, that, that's part of the package, people. We've all blown it. So here's the first thing, I, the mindset you have to address. There's two mindsets. This first one is for maybe some of you who are sitting down. <laughs> Don't deny it could happen to you. Don't deny it could happen to you. This is an unhealthy Mindset, And we're going to see some unhealthy practices it leads to. But Peter, in Luke chapter 22, the same chapter, just moments before this event happened, said these words. 
Luke 22, 31 said, uh, Peter, or Jesus was addressed him, and he says, Simon, Simon, or Peter, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, this is Jesus speaking, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. See, Peter was in denial that he could blow it in ministry. He had that personality that, that some of us have that says, I'll do it, I, I, can, I can do it all, I can take it all on, and, and it's not gonna happen to me. Yeah, there's others that might, it might happen to, but not me. I'm gonna be faithful to the very end. And that's a great heart and desire to have, but it's not realistic while we're here on this earth. You're gonna blow it. And here's what some negative, unhealthy practices that come when we embrace a mindset like Peter had here that says, oh, it won't happen to me. Here's three things. These aren't in your notes, but just make note of them yourself. The first thing that this kind of denial leads to in an unhealthy practice is it makes you unmerciful to others' failures. This kind of mindset makes you very unmerciful to others' failures. And you snub your nose as, oh, that person blew it again, man. They're not like me. If they were like me, they'd be more faithful. And we begin looking down at other believers as if somehow we're better than they are. And really the truth is, is we're just in denial of some of the issues where we are falling short. But if you just ask someone close to you, trust me, they'll be able to tell you where you haven't been as faithful as you think. When we expect and realize it's part of the package, it affects how we treat others. Second thing it does is it results in a lack of healthy accountability. See, when you're in denial that that could ever happen to you, then you begin to live a lifestyle that's very isolated and separated from any kind of healthy accountability in your life because you believe you're some kind of superhuman-powered Christian. Oh, there's people that need accountability. There's others that need someone to speak into their lives, but, but no one should confront me. No one should be able to speak into my life. That's the Peter mindset that says, this could never happen to me. This happens with people all the time. And it results in a fall. As scripture says, pride cometh before a fall. Third thing it does is it leads to risky practices. When we fail to have healthy accountability and we fail to recognize that it could happen and it will happen to us, it leads us to risky practices. Risky practices with the opposite sex. We get engaged in relationships that we know are beyond the boundaries because we think, oh, I'll never have an affair. I mean, I'm a pastor. You don't have to open up the paper too frequently to see another pastor that's fallen into an immoral relationship. Unhealthy practices with handling money. Oh, that would never happen to me. I'd never embezzle or steal from my company or from my school or from my church. And when we're in denial that it could happen to any of us, we begin to be very flippant about our practices. See, one of the things I've learned early on in reading stories about other pastors is, is this. I've never met, I've never, I've met some pastor, pastors that have had a moral failure like this. I've talked with them, and not one of them has ever said this. Chad, my desire in going into ministry is to spend 15 years of my life pouring into this church body, building it up, and then have an immoral affair with someone in the church that blows it all out of the water. That's my goal in life. I've never heard one say that. But what happens is they think, oh, I've gotten to a point where I minister to other people that have walked through that, but that could never happen to me. And so they begin unhealthy practices that put them in situations where they're more vulnerable to those things. And sure enough, just like any of us, they fall prey to it because they fail to believe that it could happen to them. It's one of the reasons I have boundaries on how I counsel. I won't counsel a woman past an initial visit to assess some things, and even then my door is either open so the secretary can see it, or if it's extremely private, there's a window in my door that we put in so she can always see what's going on, and I'll always refer them after that to another female or another situation. Because what happens in counseling situations is a lot of stuff is shared and a bond is formed and what began as just a ministry relationship turns into something much more and my marriage is way too important to allow that to happen. 
and my position here is too important for me to think that I'm immune to that. I believe it could happen to me. I know it could. So I'm going to protect and put up boundaries that will prevent it, if any possible way, from happening. The same is true with money. We have multiple teams at different places that handle the money here. I can't write a check and sign it. No one can in our office. You have multiple people that always interact from the counters to the people that do the deposits, all those things. Why? Because it happens all the time. Can we totally prevent it from happening? No. But we can put up some means that say, you know what, we're all prone to mismanaging or stepping in. Let's put up as many things as possible to make sure there's more than one set of eyes for healthy accountability. People, it can happen to any of us. And if you don't have a mindset that believes that, you are gonna cripple yourself in ministry. Second mindset is this. Not only don't deny it could happen to you, but don't forget that restoration is possible. This is the other side of it. Denial is sometimes pride saying, oh, it won't happen to me. The forgetting is a, a sense of uselessness that says, oh, it has happened. I've blown it. There's no way I can be used again. That's the other extreme. Don't forget that restoration is possible. In fact, it's desired. And God's written this over and over in the scriptures. There's tons of examples, but one of my favorite, there's several Psalms that end like this, but Psalm 51 is one of them. And Psalm 51 is, is a prayer that David wrote after his great moral failure. He'd had an affair with another man's wife. He'd ended up murdering that husband so he could take the wife. A huge period in his life where he was in rebellion against God. And when God broke him, and restored him, this was a psalm that he wrote about that experience, confessing, asking God to cleanse him, but he wrote this towards the end of it. I love this section. There's many psalms that end like this. It says, restore to me the joy of your salvation. He's talking about being restored. And uphold me with a willing spirit. And then he says these words. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Notice who he's talking about. He's acknowledging himself as a sinner and saying, restore me, God, because then I'll teach other transgressors that are going down the same path, making the same stupid choice that I made. If you'll restore me, I'll use my life to tell others about how they can avoid that. And sinners, just like me, will return to you. Isn't that an awesome passage? It's reminding us that restoration is God's heart for all of us. But how do we do it? How can we be restored? Well, let's look at the second part of this story that's in the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and see how Jesus restored Peter. And from that, we can learn two actions that we need to engage in as followers as well. John 21, 15 through 17. This is uh, Jesus after his resurrection and Peter and his, uh, some of the guys are out fishing again and Jesus calls them in and here's one of the most intimate interactions they have after his resurrection. And what happens here is Jesus is in the process of restoring Peter after what he had done. You could imagine what it might have been like for Peter to see Jesus for the first time after the last time he looked into his Savior's eyes was immediately after he denied him three times. And now he's gonna sit with him face to face over breakfast. And here's what happens. Verse 15 says, when they had finished breakfast, it was probably uh, barbacoa or egg and bacon tacos, I'm sure, right? Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Lambs, they're symbolic of, of Jesus' people. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. 
Here's the second half of it is Jesus restores me by confronting my failure. Jesus restores me by confronting my failure. We tend to run from it. We tend to want to hide it or dismiss it or put it away. Jesus says, we got to confront this. Peter, we need to deal with this. But we're going to learn how he does it and why it's so important to address some of the weaknesses and the ways in which we often do it ourselves. So here's the first action that's required in terms of being restored. Restoration requires confrontation. Restoration requires confrontation. Notice three times Peter addresses, excuse me, Jesus addresses Peter. Our tendency, if we're honest, is that we just want it to go away. Let's just avoid it for a while, and when the emotions come back down, hopefully everything will be better. But it never is. And no one ever really grows from that. Three things I want you to see in here from this and from the scriptures that are key to this idea of restoration requires requires confrontation. These aren't in your notes, but just jot them down. I think they're so vital. The first thing we must see for restoration and confrontation is someone must initiate it. Someone must initiate. Okay, we've all done this where we avoid certain people when we come to church or we keep walking around, we do all this kind of stuff, and no one wants to initiate the process. But Jesus, it was the first thing he did next time he saw Peter. Not to rub it in Peter's nose, as we're going to see, but to restore him. You have to confront the situation for restoration to happen. Someone must initiate it. Now, the Bible says it in this way as in other passages. The first thing the Bible says is the person sinned against is the one that the Bible challenges to initiate. Matthew 18, 15 says it like this. Read this passage. It says, if your brother, it's talking about brothers in Christ or sisters, okay, another believer, you could interpret that as, if another believer sins against you, it says, go and tell him or her his fault between you and him alone. Okay, so who's initiating it in that situation? The one who's been sinned against, right? Okay, because here's what we often do. We get offended by someone or someone does something, we go, oh, that just ticks me off. They, They know they did that. They they should know they did that. Why aren't they saying anything? They should know they did that. It's their responsibility. They sinned against me. They offended me. They should be here at my feet on their knees begging for forgiveness. The Bible never says that. Because sometimes people in their ignorance don't even realize it. It says if you've been sinned against, you're responsible for going to that person. and says if he listens to you, you've gained your brother. Galatians 6 puts another party in some responsibility. So first, if you're the one sinned against, you're called to go restore. In Galatians 6, we see that a third party believer can also be responsible, should be responsible to initiate and care about the body enough to restore. Galatians 6.1 says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, Meaning, if anyone else, someone you see or some situation going on, it says, you who are spiritual, meaning you who are believers, should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. That principle is talking about what we talked about earlier. Hey, be careful, because you could fall into this as well. That's saying if you've seen a situation where a sin has occurred, that you have some responsibility if you're a believer, to go and restore it. There's only one other passage that really talks about this in Matthew 5. It even talks about when you come to worship. It says if you come with your offering, you come to worship, and you know that someone else, another brother, has something against you, it says drop your offering or your worship and go and be reconciled to them before you worship. But there's something that's stated in that passage that's very clear. It says if you come to worship and you what? You know that a brother or sister has something against you? How would you know that a brother or sister has something against you? Because they would have shared it with you. They would have done this process, they would have initiated it, and maybe you weren't willing to reconcile, and now you're coming and trying to worship and be reconciled with God and worship with God, but yet you haven't addressed that situation that they brought to you. It says, you stop worshiping, you put it down, and you go and be reconciled to that brother. The person sinned against 
is responsible to initiate or a third party that's seen it. Here's what you do. You not only initiate, that's one step, one thing you do. The second is you ask a question like this. Does the person love Jesus and are they grieved that they have harmed the relationship? Okay, so someone's got to initiate. When you address them, the issue is about do they love Jesus and, and, and are you in a relationship where there's love going pl- back and forth and are they grieved that they have harmed the relationship? See, Jesus doesn't come and immediately just address the behavior. He doesn't come up and say, Simon, do you promise to never deny me again? And Simon goes, yes, God, I won't deny you again. And he goes, Simon, do you promise to not deny me again? See, we tend to focus so much on the behavior. And it's not the saying that the behavior shouldn't be addressed, but what Jesus addressed was the issue behind it. It was an issue of love. Because when Peter was sitting around with those people who were part of the group crucifying Jesus, and Jesus is right next door in the courtyard being beaten, Peter had a love problem. See, he was more... He was loving the people around him more, meaning he wanted their approval more at that moment than he wanted the approval of his Savior. And so he would rather be liked by those around him than loved by his own Savior. You with me? And that's why Peter was restored by saying, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Because our issues always boil down to an issue of our love for our Savior and our love for others. We need to address that issue as well. Third thing is confrontation should be consistent with the sin. The confrontation should be consistent with the sin. See, Peter's boasting was in public. He made his boastful statement amongst all the disciples, and Jesus confronted him amongst all the disciples. They were all sitting there when this took place. And so, Our confrontation of another person or what it results in should be consistent with the arena in which it took place. If someone slanders you in front of a whole group of people, guess what? They should be responsible not just for coming to you and and apologizing personally. They should be willing to come back to that group and say, you know what? What I said was wrong. It was improper. Because if they aren't included, then they go on with that misinformation indefinitely. Are you with me? Confrontation is consistent. If a, a, a leader or an elder is addressed or caught in some kind of persistent sin, the Bible says this in 1 Timothy 5, it said if two or three people witness an elder or a spiritual leader caught in some sin, they should be rebuked, it says, in the midst of all. Why? Because they have shepherded and led in the midst of all. And so their correction should take place in front of all. You don't dismiss a pastor who's had a, uh, an immoral failure. You don't just let them slip out the back door and never say anything to the congregation. If they've been in front of all, they should be addressed in front of all. It's part of the process. Our motto here at Grace, one that we use as leaders, is that we will address things with as many as necessary, but as few as possible. In that Matthew passage, it says, if your brother sins against you, you go to him in private. You don't come up here and tell everyone he did. You go to him in private. You do it in the setting in which it happened. Ours is, is we're going to tell as many people as necessary, but as few as possible. As many as necessary for the health of the whole, but as few as possible to allow the dignity of that individual to be restored as they re-engage. The goal is not to slander or harm. The goal is to handle it properly. Second thing we need to engage in, not just restoration requires confrontation, but restoration results in my re-engagement. This is the purpose of it. Restoration results in my re-engagement. We don't confront in order to rub it in someone's nose and push them out. We confront in order to restore and re-engage them. In fact, I believe Jesus did this three times to Peter. He asked him this question three times, not to rub it in his face, not to make him feel bad, but to show him without a doubt, you deny me three times, Peter, and I'll restore you three times. I think if Peter would have done it 10 times, Jesus would have done it 10 times to let him know you cannot sin too much to overcome the grace that I offer you. 
And as long as someone's willing to acknowledge it, as Peter did, and, and repent and recognize what he did was wrong, Jesus is willing to restore. Restoration results in my re-engagement. Not all restoration looks the same. Not all of them look just like this. There's principles in the Bible that talk about various things, and that's another message for another time. But greater offenses require more time to restore trust. That's just part of the package. Just as various positions require more time. If you're in a a role like mine and you fall into a major blunder, there could be a situation where you are either removed indefinitely based on some things in Scripture or you're removed for a significant period of time because of the role you're in that may be very different for someone in the congregation. It's just the nature of it. The Bible speaks about those things. There's uh, th- ministries in our church that require more trust than others, but we do background checks on all the people who serve in our nursery and children's ministry. Okay? Because of the nature of those roles and the people they're working with, we need to know uh, specific information and, and have a level of trust on there. If you're an axe murderer and you're here with us today, you're not going to serve in children's ministry. Okay? We'll put you as a greeter out front. I'm kidding, okay? Okay. But you understand that different roles require different levels of trust and different times of restoration. Someone who falls from, say, a pastoral position in a a moral way, they're not eliminated forever from ministry, but they may be eliminated forever from that particular role within the body. It is possible to sin in such a way that doesn't allow you to be restored to the same position. But maybe the question we should really be asking today is not so much how can we we be restored, even though we've seen that, but there's a greater question. Why? Why can we be restored? Why can an imperfect, unholy, mistake-driven person like me be restored to a holy and perfect, sinful sinless God. How could I ever serve him? How could any of us serve him when he's perfect? I think the answer to this question is alluded to in the passage we looked at first with Peter in Luke 22. If you'll look there, Luke 22, verses 63 through 65. This passage is squeezed right up against the paragraph of Peter denying Jesus three times. And it's like a scene change where Peter is denying Jesus three times. The scene immediately turns to Jesus in the courtyard area. And it says this in verse 63. It says, now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. You see, while Peter was at his worst, denying that he even knew Jesus, Jesus was at his best, unwilling to deny you and me. While Peter was at his worst, being rightly accused of following Jesus and denying it, Jesus was in the courtyard being wrongly accused and yet accepting it for you and for me. You see, Jesus was at his best when Peter was at his worst. And the same is true for you and I today. Jesus is at his best when we are at our worst so that you and I can be restored through his perfect sacrifice even when we don't deserve it. Why can we be restored? Because Jesus makes us worthy of being restored not because we bring anything to the table. Because God confronted our sin problem. He didn't overlook it. He didn't deny it. He didn't push it aside. He confronted our sin problem in the person of Jesus Christ so that you and I could be forgiven, 
and restored. Restoration requires confrontation. You see, we're restored not by covering up our unfaithfulness, but by confronting it. I love how Proverbs 28 13 says that it says, he who conceals or covers up his transgressions will not prosper. He who covers them up will not prosper. But it goes on to say, he who confesses and forsakes them will find mercy. You see, confession, we don't confess so that God can finally figure out, oh my goodness, really, Chad, you did that? We're not confessing for his sake. We're confessing for our sake. It causes us to confront our issues. 1 John 1.9 says it like this. If you, uh, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Confessing requires us to confront. And by confessing, our unfaithfulness is put on Jesus in his faithfulness is put on us. Hiding it never does anything. You see, it's in this process of pondering the gospel and putting on the gospel that transforms us. And it leads us to love our Savior more and more for his unfathomable service and sacrifice to you and me. That's what changes us. And when we confess, when we're in that moment where we come to grips with what we've done and we own it and bring it to him and we're sitting at his feet like Peter was, you need to hear the very words that he said to Peter. And when he says to you, Chad, do you love me? And we say, yes, Jesus, you know that I love you. You know my heart. You know everything. And you hear him saying to you, then Chad, feed my sheep. Chad, serve my church. Chad, lay down your life for the sake of my people just as I lay down my life for you. Could you imagine being part of a church that was filled with people who weren't afraid of admitting when they blew it and weren't afraid that when they had blown it, they could never be restored? Could you imagine being part of a church that manifested that level of authenticity? of realness, a church where people were being confronted and restored, transformed and restored. You see, making a mistake isn't the problem. A failure of restoration and confrontation is because it's the very process by which Jesus transforms us in his church. So where are you? What's keeping you from serving Jesus' church? Do you think you've done something too terrible to be restored? You've seen all the people standing who've been down that path. That's a lie from the very pit of hell that you could ever do anything that could prevent you from being restored and used in Christ's church. Let Jesus restore you. Sit down with a leader. Contact someone and confront the issue in your life that's keeping you from being who he's called you to be. Know that this is a place where you will be restored if you're willing to honestly confront. Are you afraid you might blow it if you get involved. So it's keeping you from getting involved. Let me assure you, you will blow it. It happens all the time. The issue is not, will I blow it? The issue is, will I commit to the proper process of restoration when I do? 
people, that's the church. A place where mistakes are allowed because they know they will happen and a place where mistakes are addressed in a loving manner so as to grow and be transformed through them. That's a church that I long to be part of. That's a process that I need as much as anyone. And I pray that we will all become people who will be restored through healthy confrontation and serve as a result. Let's pray.